dysfunctional family, I was homeless, you know, I've been married and divorced twice, I've been to prison, drank too much, I was a fighter, you know, the military. He said, you'll be perfect for the Church of England. My early life was a little bit disruptive, really. I was um, born into a really dysfunctional family. My mother and father were both alcoholics. To give you some idea of my father's upbringing, it was a bare knuckle street fighter in Liverpool. So you can imagine how my dad was brought up. He'd come home drunk on a Sunday like he normally did. My mum would cook a meal uh, and then there'd be a row. That was every week that happened. Uh, and this Sunday, my father um, was very volatile and went to hit my mum, and I stood in the gap. And I got the backhand that my mum was going to get. There was a big argument. And basically, my father said, I want you out of the house. So I ran upstairs, I grabbed a bag, I slammed the door behind me, and I realised after about 10 minutes, I had nowhere to go. So I was homeless and, and on the streets in Manchester for, for a while. When I was sleeping rough one night, someone brought me a cup of tea. It was a, a guy slightly older than me, and uh, maybe he took pity on me, but he said, come on, we've got a squat in a place called Stockport, just outside Manchester. I remember there was no windows. That was a surprise. There was sort of curtains hanging over the windows, and there was just rubbish all over the floor. That there was, there was drugs. And then what happened to me, I, I got involved in, in a gang. So what would happen is that a group would go out and just nick anything that wasn't sort of tied down. You know, so that was breaking into houses, which I'm not proud of, uh, shops, warehouses, stealing scooters, bikes, all sorts of things like that. You know, I'm not proud of being a thief. That's what I was. Um, but I kind of fell into it because I didn't really know what else to do. And so that led to, you know, bound over to keep the peace, magistrates, court, probation, fines, which I couldn't pay because I didn't have any money and I didn't want to pay them. And eventually the system got tired of me. I got put back in front of a magistrate in Manchester. And this time it was a little bit more serious. This time, the, the senior magistrate in the middle said, you're abusing the system. You, my son, are going to prison. I, I remember even now, you know, many, many years later, how I almost threw up. I got a year's sentence. I did six months, uh, just over, and that place frightened the life out of me. And I remember going to the reception area and, and being stripped, which was, was traumatic given at the time, if I remember correctly, like a bib and brace, overalls and a striped shirt, classic. And all my stuff being put into a box. I was doubled up with a, 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 a large guy from Liverpool who kind of looked after me uh, a, a little bit and basically just said, you know, keep your head down, get a job, avoid eye contact and just do your time and get out. But when I got released and got that box back down with my name on it, and got out of this donkey jacket and stuff, whatever it was, uh, and got my clothes back on me again and my bits and pieces. <clears throat> I remember feeling excited but anxious again. And when I got through the reception area, still in, in, in the detention centre in Risley, uh, my father was stood there, um, which again shocked me. And I remember seeing him stood there and, and we didn't speak. I, I walked out with him and I remember saying, I'm certainly not going back in there again. And I remember my father saying, yeah, that's what I said. And that was the first time I had any idea that my father had been in prison. We never talked, it, talked about that ever again. I knew nothing about him and he never spoke to me about it. But I was kind of excited about getting out of that place, um, which was awful but also scared about what was I going to do next in this world. What I did is I, I got a job driving a, a van, a furniture van. And when I was driving into Manchester one day to do some delivery or drop-off, I saw this poster for the army. 
It was a, a massive billboard and uh, it had two soldiers on it in camouflage uniform. The backdrop was mountains with snow on the top and they were skiing down a mountain. And underneath it said, would you like a, a life of adventure? Then try the British Army. And I thought, you know what, that looks really cool. So I found out where the recruiting office was uh, in a place called Fountain Street in Manchester. I said, the stuff on the poster with all the kit and the backdrop and the snow and the skiing stuff and the adventure, I quite like a bit of that, where do I sign up? Well, he sort of smiled and sat me down and I talked to him. I said I'd not long been released from prison, I was honest. And he went, ah, we don't take anyone with criminal convictions. I said, really? He goes, no, not, not recent criminal convictions. I said, is that it? He said, yeah, I'm sorry, that, that's it. And as I got up, he kind of shook my hand, patted me on the shoulder and winked at me and said, but you never know, son, if you keep trying. I went back every week for nearly six months and I had the same conversation, the same handshake, the same wink and the same, you never know, son. I met him again and I said, look, before you tell me, can you just say, Am I able to get in the army or not? I was a bit fed up with it. And he said, come with me. And I went through the offices into another office and uh, I met a senior officer there. And this major just looked at me and said, we've been watching you. You're pretty determined to get in the army, aren't you? And said, we don't take people with criminal records, but I'm gonna take a chance on you, son. Do not let me down and then stamped a piece of paper, gave me a little Bible, uh, which I've still got uh, for my introduction into the army, 27th of January, 1976. I guess really he saw something in me that I didn't see in myself or I'd had systematically knocked out of me. 17 years I spent in the military and I really tried not to let him down. Whoever he is, I've never seen him since. Eventually I did the skiing that was on that poster Physically, it saved my life, the army. I, I came out as a staff sergeant, uh, which I was very proud of. But I still had no moral compass, if that makes any sense. You know, I, you know, during that time, I went through two marriages, two divorces. Uh, I won't say I was an alcoholic, but I, but I drank too much. And actually, what I'd turned into was my father, who I despised. But I'd become this character of a fighter, a drinker, and, and a, a womanizer. So even though my military career was really well done, my, my moral life was, was, was a complete mess, but I would never tell anybody that. But what happened to me is that I left the army after 17 years. My mother got back in touch with me. She came to see me and Amanda, my girlfriend at the time. And while I was away with Amanda, um, my mum got ill. She collapsed, was taken to hospital. She was a heavy smoker, both my parents were. And I had about 10 days with her in hospital. But I was with her at the side of the bed with Amanda and she'd gone into a, a, a coma. And, and I remember saying to Amanda, I'd like to get into bed with my mum. Do you think that's all right? And uh, Amanda said, you should do what you want, Paul. And yeah, you know, fully clothed, I just lay next to my mum and I put my arm around her and her head was on here. She was a tiny thing and, and the cancer had done what cancer does to her. Uh, and I remember talking to her, saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for all the stuff I put you through. I'm sorry for not being with you. And the, the machine at the side with a heart monitor just went from a, from a bleep to a constant thing. And, and she died on my chest, my mum. That was really traumatic, but not for the obvious reasons that you might think. It was traumatic for me because I hadn't had a relationship with my mother. I was really angry because I'm a fix-it person and, and, and I couldn't fix that. And, and as I was going through her stuff, I found a Bible and, and I opened it. And there was pictures of me as a kid in it, uh, which was a bit emotional. And on the back page was a phone number and it was a Manchester code and, and I phoned it and, and I said, who are you? How do you know my mother? And what are you doing in the back of this Bible? Uh, and this woman on the other end said, oh, you must be Paul, Brenda's son. 
I said, yes, I am. How do you know my mother? And then, you know, quite joyfully, she said, oh, that Bible you've got, Paul, was given to your mum when she was um, baptised and joined our church. And I didn't know what to say. I just said, my mother's dead. And I hung up. And it was that that I, I just could not understand my mother being this Christian churchgoer because I had a preconceived idea of a, of a Christian and, and it wasn't my mother. And eventually I, I wandered into this church in central London called Holy Trinity Brompton. And as I walked out, someone uh, on the door offered me a leaflet and I pulled it out and it was... Um, it was an introduction to the Christian faith. I thought, you know what, in 17 years, I've done every course you could possibly think of. You know, missile system, I was a sniper, you know, the five different regiments, all that. I thought, I'll do a course on God. Uh, I'll find out if it's true. And more importantly, I'll find out what happened to my mother. But halfway through it, I, I, had, um, I had a moment. I remember thinking, I can't believe that God could love someone like me unconditionally. I kind of dropped to my knees and I said, you know, if you're up there and all this stuff's true and you can love someone like me and you can help me and you can change me into a better person, then you know what? Let's go for it. And, and I just spoke about stuff and then somebody on the staff heard that I mentioned prison. And then what happened then is I, uh, I got asked if I wanted to go on a prison visit to Dartmoor Prison, to which I said, no, on your bike, not at all. I've been trying to stay out of prison most of my life. Anyway, this lady was very persuasive uh, and, and I ended up going, again, I shared my story and then the men came and chatted to me and they had similar or a lot worse stories than me. And in the end, uh, I, I got offered a position in 96 if I wanted to come on staff as a prison pastor. So I joined the church as a prison pastor. And then from that, I got more into the, the justice sector, I guess. You know, I really got passionate about prisons. When I was working for the church, I used to run conferences or help support and speak at conferences around the world. And I got more involved in prison systems around the world. And one of these conferences was in Botswana. And I'd finished speaking at the conference. I'd done some prison visits. And at the end of the conference, they said, um, we're going to go on a safari to the Okavanga Delta. I went to the bar for, for, for a drink. I noticed this person stood next to me, the only person at the bar. Uh, and as I paid for the drinks, he said to me, are you with that, that mob? I said, yeah, I am. So what did you do then? And I thought, I'm going to have a bit of a laugh with you. I said, have a guess. So he looked at me and he said, are you a policeman? I said, no, are you this, are you that? And he went through about five things. I said, no, I said, um, I'm a vicar in the Church of England. He said, what, dress like that? You look like Crocodile Dundee. So I said, uh, no, I'm doing this. I've just got, I'm getting changed. You know, we're here for that. And I told him what I do, you know, as, as a story and, and what I hope to do in prisons and what we've been doing. And he said to me, do you know who I am? I said, I have no idea. He said, have you heard of Iceland Foods? I said, yeah, of course, everyone's heard of Iceland Foods. He said, well, my name's Malcolm Walker. I'm the owner and the founder of it. And he said, I'm interested in maybe helping men and women when they come out of prison to get in some of my stores. And then in July last year, he called me and said, could we have lunch? And I had lunch with him. We talked about a few things. He said, I'm still interested in this ex-offender thing. What do I need to do? So I kind of told him what he needs to do. You need to hire someone at a senior level. They need to be on your executive committee. You need to embed it in the system and, and then it might work. We chatted. He said, I think I want to do what, what you said. I said, brilliant. I'll look for someone for you in, in, you know, in, in the marketplace who's good. He said, no, no, I want you. And I said, I, I've, I've got a job. Sir Malcolm. Uh, I, I said, I'm, I'm quite happy doing what I'm doing. He said, I want you to come here. I want you to embed this in the heart of this organization, nearly 30,000 employers. I said, okay, well, let me think about it. He said, well, can you start next week? And, and I found myself signing this contract about becoming 
the Director of Rehabilitation for Iceland Foods. I'm still a priest, but I resigned from that position and I started in October helping men and women uh, when they come out of prison or already out of prison to get jobs in Iceland food stores and, and it's working and it's I love it. It's just so exciting to see these men and women be given a second chance. Like that officer, that major, when I was 21, said, I'm going to take a chance on you. Don't let me down. Some people say that hiring people from prison is, is a risk. I think hiring anyone in the business field is a risk. I can say that the people that are coming out of prison through the selection process and the filter system are safe. I was safe as anybody else that's walking in, buying food off the shelves. I spoke to a group of store managers and finished waffling like I do, and, and I, they stood up and gave a round of applause. That they, Come on, let's get these guys, you know, and, and I loved that. And externally, again, it's been, it's been overwhelming, the amount of encouragement and, and support. And I've had a few phone calls and emails from bigger organizations that want to do it but don't know how to do it. And I, I hope and I pray that more organizations get on board and do this because imagine the impact that not only has a society but financially, everything, families, kids in care, you know, the, the whole thing could change. And, and I want to be part of that. I want to develop it. And the anecdotes are uh, that this, this is an amazing opportunity. Thank you. Uh, I can't believe how I've been accepted into a, a team. This is the first time I've had a legal wage. Uh, I've never had a pay slip before. You know, this is great. I saw my kids at the weekend, was able to buy them some, you know, things like that. If someone's not in prison, then that's a success for me because breaking that cycle of crime is one of the hardest things to do. What does the word justice mean? What does the word justice mean to me? It, it means fairness, it means compassion, it means the ability to make a, stake, make a mistake and then be forgiven, to be given a second chance, to if you commit a, a crime, then the system will sentence you, you pay the price and that's your punishment. While you're in prison, you should be, as much as possible, help to reform and change and come out better than you went in. What we should be doing is helping these men and women who come from some of the worst backgrounds you can think of in society to be better and not go back in. To me, that's the justice system. And there's a piece of scripture in Proverbs in the Bible that says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. And most people in prison, to my uh, understanding, I've had that hope knocked out of them for various reasons, either in childhood, uh, through their own fault, through their parenting, whatever it is, and they are hopeless. And, and I think once you give someone hope, then you need to, to follow through with that. And hope can change a person's heart.